I'd like to call this meeting of the Yankton Board of City Commissioners to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Sorry about Here. Bernie. Gross? Here. Johnson? Here. Knopf? Here. Maibaum? Here. Weiner? Here. Moser? Here. Mayor Hoffman? Present. City Manager Nelson? Here. City Attorney Denver? Here. Hey, thank you all for coming. I, the Vikings are not going to play behind us, so I, you, guys, you came for that. You came for the wrong thing. But welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. The first order of business under routine business is the... Uh, yeah, before the minutes of the regular meeting of September 25th and the work session for September 25th. Was Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Anybody from the public? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number three under routine business is a scheduled bills you have before you. I move we pay the bills. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to pay the bills. Any discussion in regards to the bills? Anybody from the audience? Roll call, please. Gross. Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kanoff? Aye. Maibon? Aye. Miner? Aye. Moser? Aye. Sarda? Aye. Mayor Hoffman? Aye. Motion carried. We have a proclamation. I don't know if Tom is here. Is here. Do this or we'll wait a little bit. We'll do the. Okay. We'll have the city manager report first, please. Thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the commission. Couple things uh, to visit with you and with the public about this evening. First, uh, West Side Park Pond. Some of you may have noticed that the water level is less than desirable over the course of the summer. We had hoped that that was uh, solely due to the drought, um, but now that we've had some wetter weather, we realize that, in fact, um, that's not the case. Um, we've taken a look at our artesian well, and we've spoken with a, a well expert who has worked with our park staff um, Temporarily, we have um, done some siphoning uh, through a hole, a hose with the well, and that has created some flow. So we do believe that we have some flow now to the park pond. Uh, we also use some city water today from a hydrant to fill up the pond a little more. Um, so our plan right now is to have our staff monitor that over the fall and in the spring, and then visit with you all in budget season next spring if you would like to um, you know continue with that type of process or if you'd like to invest in drilling a new well and that will really depend upon how well the well flows <laughs> so that's where we stand with Westside Park Pond I know a lot of neighbors are concerned you know it's kind of the front door of uh, a very sacred heart so we want it looking nice we realize it's an important uh, feature of our community so we want to keep monitoring that also um, wanted to bring forward that, um, as you know, many of you know, we've had an underwater analysis of the um, Meridian Bridge done on September 20, 23rd. The divers were here. We do not have um, the report, full analysis back yet from the state consultant that worked on that for us. Uh, once we do, I think it's prudent to take a look at our bridge policies to make sure that they're servicing us and to make sure that we are able to utilize the bridge in the ways we want to as safely as we would like to. Um, so in order to do that, I think it's uh, prudent to have some staff work with representation from the commission to look at those policies, our rental policies, with the new information that we will have, as well as make a recommendation regarding the deck inspections, because truly the deck inspections um, is what's going to be um, determining the level of weight uh, that the bridge can handle going forward. So I'm looking for, I guess, volunteers. Um, I will volunteer. As will I. 
Mosier, Johnson, anyone else? I was thinking three, but. Dave, okay, we will get you all together with staff. Um, we have been working with Harvest Halloween to help them accommodate their event. Um, if they plan to use the bridge, it sounds like right now they do not, but if they would like to, we can work with them with some parameters for that event. Otherwise, we have some months because the bridge is primarily used for pedestrian use during the winter months. So, Any other direction from the commission on that item? Okay, I will move on. I'm just about done here. Um, also, I wanted to remind the public household hazardous waste uh, we will be collecting your household hazardous waste at the transportation on Saturday, which is the 14th from 9 to 1. It's $10 per vehicle, so if you have some uh, household hazardous waste, the list of acceptable materials is on our website. You can drop those off um, at that time. Also, in visiting uh, with Ross and with Al, uh, we've been having some discussions with some of you about uh, the protocol for our agenda and what is appropriate uh, for the public appearances and how things can be placed on the agenda by commissioners. In talking about that, uh, we think that it's uh, the best course of action to have the commission set some policy on that. Uh, right now we're talking about recommending to you all that uh, public appearances be re a time reserved for the public to come to you and uh, make you aware of situations or uh, give accolades to city staff, no, just kidding, or make comments, you know, concerns, any of those things, questions. And then if the commission wants it on the agenda, they can direct staff that way. However, we don't have a formal process right now for the commission to ask for things to be placed on the agenda. So um, we would like to make that available to you so that there is a formal uh, process for you to follow. So uh, Ross and Al and I are working on that. We're looking into some of the state statutes to make sure we're within the letter of the law, and then we'd like to bring something forward to you, um, not at the next meeting, but probably the first meeting in November. Two more quick things. I did not get this on the agenda, so this is for the uh, benefit of the press and the public. Tuesday, uh, October 17th, is the State of the Community address that's happening at 1130. I'm looking at the chamber here, 1130 at Minerva's. Um, I'm not sure how many folks are registered here from the commission, but we usually do have commissioners, so no action to be taken, um, just a notification that we could have a quorum of the city commission. Um, our next meeting is October 23rd. There will be a work session. You'll be talking about that during consent items on your consent calendar. I will not be at that city commission meeting. Um, as, you are, uh, as you might remember, I received a partial grant to attend the um, manager city managers conference so i'll be in attendance but al will uh, take care of the meeting and you'll be in good hands so unless there's questions of me on any of those topics or anything else um, i will be quiet so you can do your business thank you question when was the hazardous waste date saturday the 14th okay and then um that work session to talk about those calmers do you think that's an hour discussion you know last time we came at six got done pretty quick and then just sit around for half hour 45 minutes so I'm wondering is that something that should I'm just wondering how much discussion can be it's at garnered. the Commission's pleasure what is going to be um, brought forward to you all to look at will be uh, the concept street design as well as some ideas that we've heard from folks that we worked with with Design South Dakota and um, with the downtown Meridian District groups on streetscape features, um, as well as talking about you know potential partners like Keep Yankton Beautiful and others who have indicated they may sponsor certain features. Um, there's no action to be taken. We just don't want to start moving through design, formal design, without you all nodding your head saying, you know, yep, we like the streetscape design, but uh, I think it could probably uh, get done in a half an hour. It depends upon how much you all want to discuss. So it, it's really more than just the Calmers, it's the whole Walnut Street. It's the Calmers, the Walnut Street corridor, as well as the two parking lots and uh, landscaping design that we'll be considering for those downtown. So it'll be engineering department, community development, and parks. So it, it could take that long. So we'll leave it at 6 o'clock for now and, I don't know, maybe bring a book or something. If, Hey, thank you, Amy. Any other questions for Amy? Okay, moving on. Dr. Tom Stoltz, we have a proclamation for to read for you. 
Do you want to? Well, I'll read it off and then come forward because it's, you know, um, appreciate it. Whereas, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as many as one in four patients who receive prescription opioids long term for non cancer pain in primary care settings struggles with addiction. And whereas every day more than 1,000 people are treated in the ER for misusing prescription opioids. And deaths involving opioids have quadrupled since 1999. Whereas the spread of opioid abuse has prompted the White House to announce it will designate the opioid crisis a national emergency. And whereas because of this ep epidemic, the need for non-invasive, non-drug approaches to pain management for common musculoskeletal conditions such as back pain has increased throughout the world and particularly in the United States. And whereas the American College of Physicians, ACP, in 2017 released updated low back pain treatment guidelines that promote the use of non-invasive, non-drug approaches as a first line of defense against back pain before the use of pain medication and surgery. And whereas chiropractors focus on the whole person with their non-invasive, non-drug approach to health care and pain management. And whereas there is a growing body of research validating the effectiveness of chiropractic services, spinal manipulation in particular for the treatment of lower back pain, leading many respected health care organizations such as the ACP to include chiropractic spinal manipulation in their guidelines for physicians. And whereas National Chiropractic Health Month 2017 serves as a reminder to all citizens of the city of Yankton that non-invasive, non-drug treatments for low back pain such as chiropractic services, spinal manipulation may lessen or eliminate the need for riskier, potentially addictive treatments such as prescription opioid pain medications and should be thoroughly exhausted wherever possible before initiating over-the-counter and prescription opioid therapy. And now therefore I, Jake Hoffman, the mayor of the city of Yankton, do hereby proclaim October 2017 as National Chiropractic Health Month. In the city of Yankton, South Dakota, I urge all citizens to celebrate National Chiropractic Health Month. Health Month. Tom, you want to come forward? Thank you, Mayor, for this proclamation. Just wanted to emphasize the fact that the reason I'm here tonight is because I heard Amy on the radio this morning said that the public can come forward with some things. And this is something I've been intended to do every year in October is Chiropractic Health Month. And I just have never gotten it done until someone challenged me to get it done this morning. And so I got it done. And I thank you so very much for this opportunity. Hey, thank you. And sorry about we didn't get it in frame. No time. But Moving on to public appearances, we have some uh, folks that were on the schedule and we'll put them, and we visit with them, that'd be okay. We're gonna combine the items because they tie together with production agriculture on item five of the new, on the new business. Anybody else would like to be on the agenda that's not pertaining to something on the agenda, something they'd like to add from the public? All right, thank you. This time we'll move on to number two under routine business, consent items. We have only four, so I'll do them individually. First one we talked about already is the work session, October 23rd. Any uh, changes on the time? Are you guys okay with uh, six? Okay, number one, or number two, excuse me, Establish a public hearing for the sale of alcoholic beverages October 23rd from the center. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number three, 
under consent items, establish a public hearing on October 23rd for a license for October or April 21st from the center again. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. The last item under consent items established a public hearing again October 23rd for a request from Shree uh, for alcoholic beverages on and off sale, malt beverage. Motion. Move consent so item four. I will second that. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. We have no old business, so we'll move right on to new business. Number one under new business is the presentation of the 2016 City of Yankton Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. If I could, I'd uh, like to welcome uh, Graham Forbes from Williams and Company. Uh, Graham, congratulations. This is the largest turnout we've had ever. <laughs> I'm sure they're all here to hear me too. To your so. annual report. Now, as much as I'd like to think otherwise, Al, I'm guessing they're not here to listen to me. So I'll uh, keep things fairly brief, as it looks like you've got uh, a few discussion items to come here. But uh, feel free to stop me with any questions, or, or at the end of my little spiel here, um, ask any questions you like as well. Um, as Al mentioned, my name is Graham Forbes with Williams Company. Um, led the charge on the audit this year. I uh, just want to thank Al and all finance staff for assisting with, the, with that. It uh, takes a lot of time to put together all the information and uh, answer all our questions and, and provide us the information we need, and we appreciate their assistance with that. So, um, again, in the nature of keeping things brief here, the, the first thing I'll do um, is on page two, and I think at least the commission anyway has copies of the report here, um, kind of the top of the page in the opinion paragraph as so aptly named is kind of the meat and potatoes of, of what you engage us to do and that's provide an opinion on the city financial statement. So in that opinion paragraph is where we state that in our opinion that the financial statements contained in the document are fairly stated in all material respects. So that's an unmodified clean if you will opinion um, which is exactly what you're after no modifications or um, disclaimers of opinion. So Good news there. Um, starting on page four is the MDNA or management's discussion and analysis. That's some information put together by city staff. <clears throat> and I, I kind of call it the cliff notes of the, of the financial statements a lot of times. If you don't want to read all 90 to 100 pages of information but want a snapshot of kind of where the city's at, that MDNA is a good spot where you can see some um, comparison to prior year information and then some city commentary on what caused some of those variations from year to year so a good spot to start there if you're looking to kind of get a, a quick shot of where we at and why so good information um, I think from there I will jump you back to page 20 um, and that is the statement of revenues and expenditures for the city governmental funds um, and on the first page on page 20 there's the column titled general fund which um, as you all in the commission know, that's the kind of overall operating fund of the city for the non-utility related enterprises. Um, and it's kind of where kind of the, the pulse is for um, kind of the city finance and where most of the city's unassigned or unrestricted dollars kind of reside at. And so you'll see from um, a net change in fund balance there at the bottom of the page of about $165,000. So and that's an increase so a, a real stable year uh, to be that close to zero and out on about a 12 million dollar budget is is you know about as stable as you can see so um, and some of the numbers we kind of keep a look at are the number of um, dollars expenditures and unassigned fund balance <clears throat> which is at about 48 percent for 2016 for 2015 it was about 45 percent so a small increase there but definitely on the high end of, of yeah, healthy for sure. Um, so I don't think any issue or concern there. Um, the only other um, fund you'll see much of a fluctuation at all is the Special Capital Improvements Fund, um, which has about a $1.4 million increase. 
that fund fluctuates pretty widely because of timing of large city projects that are funded by the sales tax funds that come in for for various projects so you'll see that increase in a year like this a uh, year down the road if a large project is in, engaged that uses those sales tax dollars you might see a large decrease so it, it just uh, a lot of timing moves into the, in and out of that fund so otherwise nothing i'm going to point out there um, i'll kind of quickly point out the same items on pages 25 and 26 for the city utility funds um, you will see that the water and wastewater funds uh, towards the bottom of page 25 did have some large increases in that position for the year um, the main factor there is, is two things. Um, as you know, the waterfront especially is in the midst of some significant capital expenditures to improve um, and or enhance the distribution system. And so um, because of that, A, rates have been increased over the last few years to help finance the debt incurred for those projects. And the other misleading item is in those utility funds, those expenditures for those capital projects are capitalized and not expensed in the year they're paid. So it looks like the water fund had about $3.6 million increase in fund balance, where if you look in the balance sheet, about $8 million were spent in 2016 on those plant projects as they progress. So um, unfortunately for the city, there's not $3.6 million more in the coffin, 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 coffer than there was a year before. Um, but there is a lot of dollars being spent on improvements for, for projects. Same phenomenon in the wastewater fund just on a little bit smaller scale so i just thought i'd point that out but otherwise i think good healthy results for both funds and and overall um, um no no red flags of any kind to point out there i think the last item i will point out is kind of in relation to that um, the on page uh oops. On page 58 is the um, actually starting, excuse me, on pages 57 and 58 is where we take the actual results for the general fund for the year and compare those to the budget, budgeted amounts for the same year and see, you know, how did we do for the year based on what we budgeted going into the year. And you'll see that broken down by functional area that there wasn't one area that was over budget in the general fund for the year. So... Um, I think that's positive and, and you know, good fiscal management and part of the reason why we did see an increase in that general fund fund balance. So um, no issues or, or problems to report there as well. I have a question, and this probably can go to Al. Um, the fact that in many cases we didn't spend what we budgeted and we had revenues greater than we anticipated, um, we ended up with an increase in cash carryover, does that mean we're we're too conservative in our budgets? I'd rather that than come at you and tell you, oh, by the way, we're short and we have to borrow some money. But yes, that's it's basically we're very conservative on budgeting. So, what part of that, what part of that cash carryover is unfinished projects? I Roughly. believe, if I remember right, the supplement was approximately 500000 in the general fund that, that was unfinished projects. I believe that's the number. I, I can look that up and get that to you, and I'll send that out in an email. So. Any other questions? <coughs> Otherwise, like I said, as much as I'm sure you're enjoying soaking up this information, uh, I'll, I'll kind of cut things off there unless somebody following that is a lot of supplemental schedules that show some of the smaller funds of the city that combine and, and roll up into the the uh, major funds or not major funds in front of the report. So if you're looking for detail in any um, other fund, that, that information is contained behind the notes and the supplementary information there. Well, thank you very much. Yep, this, thank you. This time I would entertain a motion to approve the comprehensive financial report. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Mo thank you. Moving on to number two under new business, memorandum 17-217. The 
Chamber of Commerce collaborative collaboration discussion. Bridget. Hello. Good evening. My name is Bridget Benson. I am the um, president of the Yankton Chamber Board of Directors. And I am here tonight because we were disheartened by the comments that were made by Commissioner Maibaum at the last City Commission meeting. We asked to be um, put onto the agenda as a discussion item tonight to give all the City Commissioners an opportunity to speak. We have a solid relationship with our 500 plus membership and that includes the City of Yankton. Due to the statements made during the public comment portion of the meeting, the entire commission was unable to comment at that time. Our board of directors have received quite a few comments from the public, believing that the commissioner's thoughts and statements were made by the whole entire commission. Um, and unfortunately, perception can be reality. We understand that with any large project, there will be there will be hurdles that arise and we need to learn from our experiences and improve upon them. There were challenges with the process. We feel by analyzing and reviewing the process, we can better prepare the city of Yankton and the chamber for our next unique opportunity. This will allow us to showcase a united Yankton community as well as all the other wonderful things that we have to offer in our community. We are stronger when we work together. The Chamber and the CVB have been working with the City of Yankton for decades, and we hope to strengthen that relationship with time. On behalf of the Yankton Chamber of Commerce, um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to present tonight, and we would really like to um, extend the opportunity for any questions or comments that you might have. Hey, thank you very much. We look forward to working with you for the better of Yankton going forward. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Number three under new business, moving on, is for Memorandum 17-218, Health Insurance Committee for Group Health Insurance. I move the memorandum. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'll just uh, bring forward, Mayor and Commission, that um, as you are aware, any change to our health insurance provider or plan needs to be negotiated through the collective bargaining unit. And we do have a tentative agreement um, with the bargaining unit where they have accepted um, the health insurance committee's recommendation. Our health insurance committee represents the entire uh, employee base, not just the bargaining unit unit members. However, uh, the bargaining unit uh, met last week and voted that um, they have a tentative agreement on this. If the commission should choose to make this change to our plan, the plan it comes to at about $180,000 savings annually to the city commission at about a 12% deduct from our current plan, which is with Walmart, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. The coverage is um, relatively the same. The plan um, construction is relatively the same. What's really different there is the um, scope of the network. So if there's any questions about the details of the recommendation, um, I'll certainly answer them. We also have dental and vision insurance recommendations there. Um, no change on providers there, but our vision insurance um, is now a different company because it was uh, bought by the, I think it's assurance company. So, thank you. Any more questions? Anybody from the audience? Roll call, please. Gross. Aye. Johnson? I am an, an employee of Bear Health, so I'm going to abstain from this vote. Kanaf? Aye. Bob? Aye. Miner? Aye. Moser? Uh, husband who works for the city. I'm abstaining. Sorry, Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Number four under new business is memorandum 17-216 and resolution 17-48 for a base salary adjustment and step plan for city employees. I'll move the memorandum for the uh, base salary adjustment and one step plan for all the employees. I will second that. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Anybody from the audience? Roll call, please. Johnson. Aye. Knopf. Aye. 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 A
Sarda? Aye. Gross? Aye. Mayor Hoffman? Aye. Motion carried. All right, moving on to number five in resolution 17 47, support of um, production agriculture. And we're going to do is have the um, uh, same amount of time equal each side. Obviously, folks opposing it, opposed against it. But what we'll do is try to explain that this is a resolution, so we have no jurisdiction. But we'd like to hear from you, and we are allowing 15 minutes per side to speak and on the uh, against it or for it. And so would you like to go first? Also, there's a microphone over here. Some people can sit there as well. We'll go ahead and start. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Please state your name and we'll do. My name is Phil Tom, I'm the uh, president of the board of directors of uh, organization Quality of Life for South Dakota. I have a package in front of you there. I don't know the slideshow behind you. And uh, also presenting is uh, Dr. Julie Ryland. Why the uptick in the CAFOs in the county? Um, basically, a lot has gone on the last year or so, mostly in Sioux City with the meat meatpacking plant. They're doing 10,000 hogs a day now, and they want to increase that to 20,000 hogs. But in the surrounding uh, states, they're at capacity, or in the case of Minnesota, they're actually a moratorium on doing anything that's left. Our uh, zoning ordinances here in the county are nearly 15 years old and amended 10 years ago. Um, but the last year, we still saw an uptick in CAFOs. We asked why that economic um, situation was arising, but the, the answer we got was that the, the ordinances always, uh, have always allowed it. Um, and now they're just coming forward. Well, we think it has more to do with Sioux City and uh, trying to get those hogs down there. And South Dakota is all that's left. The acreage looks good on a map, uh, but that, I, that uh, Highway 50 corridor is uh, filled with uh, pretty large rural populations. The aquifer is pretty shallow along the Missouri River. And our, out, our ordinances are outdated along with uh, Clay County, and they just updated theirs, and Turner County was trying to do the same. Last year, the uh, D District 3 Planning Office uh, put out a, uh, a study, um, and they did that for the state and all of District 3 in, accordant, in conjunction with the, the state to look for areas to do um, agricultural development in our county as well as the other counties in District 3. There are 392 sites that were found to have some kind of suitability for ag development, be that a, a feed lot or a, uh, a feed mill of some sort, but none were found to be suitable for, for, for uh, a CAFO. And their criteria, I can uh, get that report to you if you'd like. Um, but they had some decent criteria, and I know there's room for debate on any of those issues, but that's what they came up with in a, in a nonpartisan kind of way. This or, uh, organization that's, that's uh, supporting the resolution put this ad in the paper, and I'm just going to kind of go through that, and it kind of matches uh, some of their resolution. The claim of a tax base increase. I think much of their increase is uh, not going to be re realized. The construction companies for many of these barns are either out of county or out of state, and I'm not here to slam the, the, the companies they're using. I'd want to use the best they can, but it's not about all that money coming back into Yankton County. Some of the, the larger barns are, barns are actually uh, companies in Iowa as well as the, the uh, architect. Okay. Um, the properties for those barns do go up, the property values as they, as they build them, but they rapidly fall because they depreciate the property and have some uh, devaluation. Is there a phone somewhere? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Again, you can check all that out on the Beacon Tax website that uh, some of those values rapidly fall and the tax base for those rapidly fall in the, in the following years, so we don't really re realize some of those tax revenues. Um, the other issues there, feed sales, trucking revenue, the trucking revenue, the, the Sioux City plant owns those trucks. They're going to run those things. It's not going to be, uh, you know, an independent truck driver hauling those hogs back and forth. The vets, most of them are hired by the, by the big company, um, either Sioux City, and they'll, they'll take care of those pigs and not the, the local vets bringing that, that kind of um, money in here. So the money that uh, does, does show up um, is going to be uh, overcome um, by some costs that have come associated with CAFOs, mostly uh, road repair. Um, another 
item they mentioned is added diversity for farmers. Yep, there's uh, new things they need to do, want to do at, at times, but there's a lot of ways to diversify without, uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing something here or not, try to avoid that. Um, but there's a lot of ways to diversify your farm uh, without ripping the, uh, the community apart. Um, we've had to stand up for the ordinances to make sure they're uh, applied and, and adhered to um, at times, and we get accused of being anti-farmer, and nothing could be further from the truth. What we want is be, to be uh, societally, uh, socially, environmentally, and economically responsible in the way we move forward here in Yankton, Yankton County, and, and across the state. Um, the pollutants will add up. It may not be uh, readily apparent at first, but they will add up. And the economic cost to repair roads alone will wipe out many of the gains that you might realize by some of these CAFOs that, that come in. Even a small, a low estimate would be $25,000 a mile even to fix a, a gravel road let alone all the increased traffic is going to be on Highway 50, 52, and 81 right here through town when uh, one legally loaded semi is the same as 9,600 cars coming through as one, one semi on that road equals 9,600 cars coming through there. The health care costs for mostly immigrant workers, and I have nothing against immigrant workers, but they're uh, a, a low wage scale, and they're going to be borne by all of us in the community, at the hospitals, and the ERs as they, as they come in here to uh, to handle some of these part-time jobs that uh, are supposed to be offered. They talk about a global market efficiencies. Yeah, some of that is true. The globe is changing and it's a, it's a smaller world to bring things to. But China's uh, building their own hog confinements. And I said all this meat, but I'm talking about the meat in, in uh, basically Sioux City. That's owned by China. They own that plant. Most of that, if not all that meat, is going to go to the to China and not us. We're going to be stuck with the mess, and very few people are going to get the economic gain out of that. China, this last year, uh, last two months ago, spent $300 million on lab-grown meat technology from, uh, from companies that have developed that process. My prediction, and many uh, others talk about, in 10 to 15 years, the truly poor who need protein in their diets, and the poor around the world, the UN and us, we'll, we will feed them laboratory grown meat and not what comes out of a CAFO. So we're in the back end of a, of a dying technology bringing it in here. The U.S. Commodities President last month in an in a interview with um, the Port Council, I believe it was, noted that there's an increase in supply for 2018 and they're trying to increase the supply, not just here but across the Midwest, um, but there is no increased uh, plan in global demand. So those pork prices are probably going to fall that, that means lower impact or a lower profit for our farmers and they're going to each have their own individual problems with that when those arise. Comparison of uh, health and wealth in the counties and CAFOs. Um, it's been said in their, in their our resolution that uh, per capita income in counties with CAFOs increase their per capita income or they're, they're wealthier. That is just not borne out across the U.S. Um, in study after study in not just uh, Iowa, uh, but also in North Carolina. But Sioux, Sioux County, Iowa is 83rd out of 99 counties in Iowa in per capita income. And they have the most CAFOs per capita in Iowa and probably the U.S. The same bears true for North Carolina and some other states. Right now, Yankton, according to last year's study, Yankton County is 17 out of 66 counties in South Dakota. And we have very few CAFOs at all and limited number of AFOs. Um, and we have room for some of those. I get that, but not the way they want to bring them in um, and establish what's going on with the CAFOs right now. We all want to do better, um, but CAFOs are not the answer. The answer lies in uh, better schools, manufacturing job, high tech, medical field, perhaps even getting a lab here that uh, grows that meat for the future. And we have other opportunities like tourism. Do we actually do that here in Yankton? You bet we do. <laughs> the city itself has invested a lot of money both downtown and continuing projects to make this a tourist capital for South Dakota. And we have a, a national park right here to, uh, to take advantage of. We did over $7 million last year alone um, in this area. We can do more if we continue to emphasize that, promote, and advocate. KFOS will do nothing but hurt that cause. Just a small alone. Um, from hydrogen sulfide, and, and uh, Dr. Ryan will get into that a little bit later, is going to uh, deter most over time. Won't be next year, won't be the next maybe, but it will happen. Who knows what the long-term wildlife effects are in the fisheries and other things that we do around here. 
about 90% as of 2016 of Iowa waters were listed as impaired, meaning don't swim, don't drink, don't let your pets get in there. Food insecurity, they talk about feeding the world again. Yep, families and children in the U.S. and Yankton need our help. We're, there are places that are food insecure, but the availability of food, whether it's cheap or otherwise, nutritious or otherwise, is not the issue. What the real issue is people don't have the money to buy that food. They need better paying jobs, and public and private people and organizations need to, re need to have a good response to, to those less fortunate. And the same is true for the rest of the world. Only one half of 1% of all U.S. agriculture exports go to 19 of the countries of the countries, 19 countries of the world with the highest levels of hunger. One half of 1%. And there's a, a link there, you can check that out. And why I put the, uh, the last bullets on there is because our food supply has basically been weakened for the first time in history in the U.S. alone, two thirds of us are either overweight or obese and I, I find that appalling. And for the first time, the World Health Organization found this last year that over half of the world population is now overweight. So yes, there are areas that need our help and need, need help with food, but CAFOs are not the answer. The environmental impact, moving on, is quite simple. There's 30 to 40 years of, of data that this, the concentration of this manure is the problem. It, it's treated in pits and stays there for a year at a time, or if not longer, and produces all kinds of byproducts. And it's not just the spillage of that, they put it on the, on the fields, there's runoff, and after, year after year, these things add up, okay? This is not your grandfather's manure pile to put in your local garden or on your fields, okay? Um, I know the farmers want the right product on their field. They, they deserve that, they need to do that to keep their, their crops from growing year to year. But the bad stuff that is in that manure and in the, those pits they apply gets on those fields as well and it will run off. So that's uh, one way about the odor is not necessarily the problem and smelling it, smell of money, right? But what's in the odor is the problem. We have uh, four minutes left, so. We're gonna need a little more time then. Uh, the health risks of CAFOs. The reason I wanna bring this up is that Oh, it's not going to let me go. There we go. A lot of the data I have is Can from the past. Your, I'm sorry. State your name, please. Uh, Dr. Julie Ryland. Okay. Uh, some of the, the uh, some of the um, critics of this uh, of this information say that this is old. These are things that were that were uh, printed and published from medical journals in the past three years. So this is all very recent. In 27, uh, toxic gases, ammonia and hydrogen sulfide are the most dangerous. Uh, hydrogen sulfide is a neurotoxin and can affect children especially, so they cause uh, brain damage as well as uh, nervous spine damage. In 2017, members of Goodhue County in Minnesota recorded emissions at five CAFOs for only 16 hours out of 35 days. So just 0.2% of that time they were checking the, the um, emissions. And they found that CAFOs that had 1,200 animal units or more had over 100 unhealthy emissions in 0.2% of the time. So a very short period of time that they were checking this. 20 emissions were outside the legal limit. Duke University in 2016 published a report stating that CAFOs, the counties in, that had CAFOs with the highest number in North Carolina compared to CAFOs without had higher ER visits, hospitalizations, and deaths for various diseases compared to people who did not live in communities with large amount of CAFOs. Respiratory diseases, North Carolina and Iowa both studied this. In 2016, Duke University once again said 23% increase in asthma problems with children when their schools, they report in their schools that they smell CAFO manure in their schools two times a month. It's all they need and those kids have 23% higher risk of asthma. In Iowa, in 2015, they showed that 22.5% of the kids that live within three miles of a CAFO are higher, have a higher risk of de developing asthma than the kids that don't. Swine flu, last month in sw uh, we had swine flu that was uh, published, uh, reported in North Dakota, and then last week Maryland had several cases. Duke University found that when CAFOs, or when uh, counties that have a higher number of CAFOs actually 
report that they all get the flu. They have to report when they get the flu and when it starts for that county. So they found that the counties that had a higher concentration of CAFOs reported getting the flu sooner than other counties that didn't have CAFOs. Antibiotic-resistant pneumonia in China, they just published that there is a club C element pneumonia, which is a hypervirulent <coughs> form, and it's actually two different, or two different bacteria that combined. They were both resistant, and now they've developed a superbug. The same thing can happen to viruses as well as other bacteria, and this is just now happening this year in China. MRSA, it's well known that people who have MRSA, who are colonized with MRSA, are much more likely to develop infections. In 2014, University of Iowa reported that people living within one mile of a CAFO with 2,400 head or more were 2.7 times more likely to have an MRSA found in their skin or their nose. They also found MRSA found in residents near fields where manure was applied. They found MRSA in residents in Germany who never ever had contact with any animals but who were, had um, MRSA. And in 2013, they were able to find the MRSA from a pig confine, and they found it on workers in North Carolina. E we have uh, 15 minutes is up. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Appreciate your time. Um, does anybody want to speak about the um, production agriculture resolution? You can sit right there if you want, or go over here if you want. Is that, uh, make sure the mic is on for our home viewing audience. And state your name, please. John Gunderson. Uh, what I'm reading, uh, someone wrote and asked me to read it, but doesn't want his name used. So we'll go, I can say that this is, what he's saying is true. I remember when I was a little kid in the early 1990s, my dad taking me to a farm auction. Most of what I remember at these auctions were the older farmers who, after a lifetime of hard work and a bad year or two, were forced to sell out. I remember one sale seeing one of those four-wheel hay wagons piled up with various hand tools, wrenches and drills, etc. I remember thinking how many generations went into building that pile. I, I learned how important tools are from my father and wondered, how often was one of those particular tools critical to fixing something at one point or another, and how glad someone was to have it, that exact tool, on that day? And there it was in front of me, this pile of tools being sold for pennies on the dollar. A collection of generations in its sale was heartbreaking to me. So I concluded there was no future in farming. Prices were too variable, and one bad year could wipe someone out. So I decided at age 18 to put my hand up, join the military, and serve my country and see the world. I'm very proud of my service and what I was able to do. I was lucky. Some friends weren't. After my time in the military, I went to college. Between the GI Bill and several scholarships, it took me to live and study in the Middle East. I went to Syria, Israel, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. After college, I went to Afghanistan to work for the U.S. government for four years. During my travels, I was always keeping an eye on farmers and farming practices wherever I was at. Still a farm boy at heart, I guess. Mostly what I saw was small family farms growing food, wheat, fruits, vegetables, and whatever else that could be sold locally. A lot of weeds and poor crop compared to what I saw growing up in South Dakota. No money for good seed, fertilizer, or wheat weed control chemicals like I saw at home. These people were poor, virtually destitute, much poorer than their cousins in the cities. And they didn't care about the land or even if the land would be viable for the next generation. They were too poor to care about 10 or 20 years from now. These farmers are worried just about feeding their families that night and they know what they, were, they weren't doing a very good job of it. I also learned that most of these countries are net food importers. These small-scale operations couldn't generate enough food they need to feed their people. Farmers having to buy imported food to fuel their families. That was and is inconceivable to me. Now I'm home, back in South Dakota. My parents farm and I also farm with them. Mom's family's from Iowa. I work in town, I help my farm, folks with the farming stuff. We use a lot of the old tools, but I'm learning about other things that go into farming. There are new tools to learn about. 
There's more to farming than planting, harvesting, and fixing stuff. You have to make money, too. There is a tool called cash flow. We're lucky in this country that we have the tools that make farming much more viable. Modern equipment, GPS, irrigation, tiling, seed genetics are some of the tools farmers and this country needs to survive. Those tools don't come for free and with those tools we as farmers can make more than just minimum wage, so to speak, but a living wage. These proposed hog barns are more than just a tool financially to survive the bad years. They're also a tool to produce high quality organic fertilizer that is better for the environment than commercial petroleum based fertilizer. If these barns were, would harm the soil or water, they could destroy the farm I grew up on. If the fertilizer destroys the soil, we can't grow crops and the farm is ruined. If the runoff destroys the water, we can't graze livestock in the pastures, and the farm is ruined. I don't want that. I'm glad the state helps us monitor our soil and our water. Finally, these are not barns for big commercial ag or some industrial operation. When I first heard about these hog barns, it was me who started pushing for them to be added to the farm. I thought it was a good idea and I asked my folks, why aren't we doing this? We sell our grain to big commercial countries, companies. They take our grain and sell it to someone who feeds animals and makes money on our grain. That's fine, but why aren't we doing the feeding? My folks were initially skeptical, but they came around. My mom is big on cash flow, but my name will be on the mortgage for these barns and I'll be working for them and in them. I know people who have lived and worked around these barns for years. Both my family in Iowa and people from around the area. In the last 15 years, I have a real understanding of risk. I have learned to evaluate risk. If I thought there was a real risk to my family from these hog barns, I wouldn't be pushing for building them. I wouldn't be around, nor would I want my family to be around something that was dangerous. I didn't walk around Kabul or live in Helmand Province, Afghanistan without my bulletproof vest and I didn't go out at night after 8 p.m. in Washington, D.C. I have appreciation for risk. At the beginning of this, I mentioned tools. My sister and I know that we want to keep the farm in the family. We know that our parents, grandparents, and great -parent grandparents have acquired tools for us. We know that the for the farm to continue, we need newer tools. We now have a chance for a tool to reduce our financial risk on the farm. A steady cash flow and a greatly reduced fertilizer cost all in one package. As I said to my parents, why aren't we doing this? Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We'll have eight minutes left. Anybody else want to speak for yep. the? Production? Yes, I'll, I'll oh, speak. Go ahead, I'll make this as absolute quick as possible. My time is obviously limited, and so is yours. I don't know if everybody can see that. Commissioners, you guys can see that. My name is Lynn Peterson. I uh, live at uh, in Va at Valley Road here in Yankton. Uh, I own property in Yankton and Yankton County. Uh, I am a member of both Yankton Area Progressive Growth and Yankton County Supporters for Production Agriculture. I'm here this evening to ask for your support in signing a resolution to support the Yankton County Supporters for Production Agriculture. Yankton County Supporters for Production Ag is made up of area farmers, businesses, and citizens in both Yankton County and the city of Yankton. The mission statement of Yankton County Supporters for Production Ag is to provide, uh, to provide support for Yankton County and surrounding producers that add value to our economic system through safe farming practices, just as Mr. Gunderson stated. I want to start with letting you know that I, our family farm has a, a confinement barn exactly one half mile from the house I grew up in, the house that my parents still live in. We don't own the barn. We've never had a single 
issue. We were reluctant like everybody else in the room is, which I, I get that. We were just in that same spot. This barn has been on this property for 10 years and has not caused us ill health, uh, it, uh, harsh smells, dust, noise, or sickness of any kind to anybody in the area. It is something that we had to get through to see if, it's, if it was a good thing or a bad thing before we could move on. And I want to talk about another non, so for us it was a non-issue. I want to talk about another non-issue. The city of Yankton is surrounded by CAFOs and has been for many, many years. These are not hog confinements, but cattle feeding lots. We have lots approximately 1.8 miles north of the city, two miles straight west of, the, of Fox Run Golf Course, and one lot southwest of the city, and another 3.5 miles southeast of the city in Nebraska. Combine just three of these lots are licensed for over 35,000 head, 35, head of livestock. They operate efficiently, clean, healthy. There aren't, hasn't been any issues. They're in plain sight. Not to mention Stockman livestock in the center of the city. There is 5,000 head of permitted livestock at Stockman's. Four to 5,000 head of cattle are within city limits four to five days a week, days and nights per week. I appreciate all of these great facilities, and I would venture to guess the vast majority do not realize how close we live to so many cattle. These feedlots have been in plain sight, but people do not realize they are located where they are located. Environmental issues. Before I actually go back, let me go back. When we talk about CAFOs and if they do or they do not impact us positive, positively economically, if anybody would assume that these five CAFOs are not providing a huge economic impact to our city and our county, it's, it's nonsense. These are the trucking industry, the feed industry, the veterinarians. And also, these facilities, none of them are under roof. These have open pit lagoons and we don't notice it. Yes, everybody in this room or in the city can smell some smells an hour or two or three hours, four hours a day, whatever that may be, but they have not created a significant quality of life issue for anybody in these communities, and they have given a huge economic impact. Environmental issues. You can raise pigs in an open range setting or you can build a confinement. The open range is is an option to feed pigs in a feedlot or pasture where the runoff goes where it may. Dust, smell, flies, or noise are, noise are all inevitable. And the pigs are exposed to the harsh environments that our envi harsh elements our environment offers. Furthermore, it is very inefficient and requires no permitting process. Therefore, strict state regulations do not apply. What's my time left, Jake? <laughs> uh, economic issues. I'm going to skip actually back to what I think we all need to look at between economic issues, environmental issues, but I also want to go to health this issue, so I want to address what Dr. Ryland was speaking about. According to the 2012 USDA Census Report, Yankton County has 10,712 pigs. Sioux County has over 1.1 million. A 2017 study completed by University of Wisconsin ranks Sioux County, Iowa as the number one healthiest county in the state. The largest pig producing county in South Dakota is Hutchinson County with 127,000 pigs. They are ranked sixth healthiest. So you have to ask yourself, with the counties with the largest amount of pigs are reflected upon the healthiest. I wanted to boil that down a little bit more. I want to quote a letter to the editor in the Yankton Press and Decoden from a local, and this is Dr. Ryland, states the toxic chemicals, bacteria, and dander spewed into the air by CAFOs will increase the number of children that develop asthma if they live or go to school within three miles of a CAFO. Imagine all the elderly who would suffer from COPD and other respiratory illnesses because of exposure to the same toxic air. So let's look at some facts about the health concerns the doctor has mentioned. I found the 2010 census information and compared Sioux County, Iowa and Yankton County. Again, Sioux County being 1.1 million hogs, Yankton County 10,000. Sioux County pediatric asthma rate is 1.6% and 
In Yankton County, pediatric asthma rate is 1.9. We are higher. Now, I give you, the information is a bit dated, but it's the best we have. Sioux County adult asthma rate is 5.9%. Yankton County is 5.9%. CO, COPD rates in Sioux County are 4.4, and Yankton County is 4%. I think this information speaks for itself when discussing health concerns. This is a direct comparison between the largest hog producing county in the world, or potentially, and one of the smallest in South Dakota. And we're not seeing a difference in health issues. And believe me, as John Gunderson said, the health issue is just the first thing. I have three children I'm trying to raise, and we're also involved in production ag ourselves. This is not an issue. One minute. I will also want to uh, make one other assumption very clear. I want to kill that right now. There's a lot of people in the room. That have, there's been public comment and constant letters to the editor in the paper about the conflict of interest that surrounds Todd Woods, Don Kettering, and First Dakota Bank. Todd and Don have been ridiculed over the assumption that they are working both sides of this. This is 100% false. I have contacted a representative of First Dakota Bank as of July 14th and was told this. To date, First Dakota Bank has not received a formal application to finance any of the proposed hog buildings. If we would receive formal app at some point in the future, we will handle those requests like we would any other loan request from clients. If that were to happen, neither Todd Woods nor Don Kettering as a collateral inspector, which Don is and, and Todd is a trust advisement, investment advisor, would have anything to do with the financing request or decision process. In conclusion, uh, very quick. Hey, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Very much. Appreciate it. If you forgot where your place in, in our agenda, we're under resolution 17-47. What is the pleasure of the commission? I move to table resolution. Been moved to table. I'll second that. Moved and seconded table. Any discussions? To me, this is a simple matter <clears throat> of jurisdiction. Um, we have very clear boundaries, and this is clearly a county issue, in my opinion. I try to imagine what it would be like sitting up here and having the county pass resolutions about whether or not we should finish North Douglas Avenue, or build a swimming pool, or build a water treatment plant. and. Of course, that's not even a consideration because our jurisdiction is extremely clearly laid out. Um, I know that we're trying to work together with the county, um, and I can't imagine how we can build positive relationships with the county going forward if we don't respect the boundaries that we govern. Any, any other comments? Any other comments? I guess when we say table it, what are we talking about? Just indefinitely uh, or just in the If we table it, we can bring it back anytime we'd like. I don't know what other option we have. I just think it's really inappropriate for the city government to take a position on what the county government's trying to do. I, I would, I guess for purpose of discussion, since we're going to discuss it. I would disagree with you. This is, is we're not directing the county to make a, an ordinance change. We're not directing them to do anything. We are merely um, supporting a resolution brought to us by Yankton Area Progressive Growth in support of production ag. And so for me, it's, 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 I'm not crossing a boundary. Um, I'm exercising a right that we as a commission have to support production ag. Um, Yankton city as a beneficiary. Um, our farm communities surrounding the, the, the city shop in Yankton, um, generate sales tax dollars for Yankton, and so um, we, we do have a dog in this fight. And uh, this is a resolution supporting ag, and uh, so I would say I, I'll vote against your motion to table so that we can proceed. Any other discussion? So, you know, I look at it. I agree with Amy what she's saying. Um, of course, we support all agriculture or any growth in the county because that does benefit the city. Um, this is confined to one area 
in one item in the county, and I think if it was going to be a resolution, it should be just be broad agricultural as a general, not just one area. But another item, I, we could have a resolution in two weeks supporting the quality for life for South Dakota. Yes, and we would do the same thing. We would support that. Yes. I struggle a little bit. Is we do a lot of resolutions of support, and some of them are uh, aimed at funding. We, need, we support some uh, apartment complex because they need our support in order to get funding. Um, a resolution like this, it's just going to sit there, and it doesn't really benefit one, one group. It's just going to sit there on someone's desk, or it's just going to sit here in the, in the Internet somewhere. So um, I think that we should table it and, in a way, not bring it back. Any other discussion on the commission? Uh, Charlie, I guess the the only only thing I would say what you're talking about is that this specifically supports a group and and what Dave mentioned and then another group comes in um, because let's face it agriculture is the bread and butter of this community and of South Dakota and Nebraska and Iowa the entire Midwest and when agriculture gets sick we get sick and so um, you know, as I sit and listen to the debates and I read the paper and everything that's going on, um, it seems to me that there's this, we either have it or we don't have it uh, with concentrated animal operations. And I step back and I say, I don't know that you can be in agriculture and not adapt to the trends that are going on. And so if we are to support um, a resolution what I would say is you know I, I have no problem with production agriculture I think it is the future I think that's where it I can't imagine it goes back um, but when we talk about doing it in a safe sustainable environmentally conscious way that's the language that I'd like in there too so that we we advance it because I think it's inevitable that's where it's gonna go but I want it to be done in a way that um, respects neighbors and you know I I tend to think that we're getting there or maybe we are there I was hoping to go on that tour but it was at the same time as our meeting so um, to see what these operations are but um, I would like our own resolution if we are going to do one versus just support a group because we can't control what the group does once we support so uh, to me I would I have no problem bringing it back I just would want to have it be our own language in support of agriculture. Thank you, Dave. And be advised, we can sure have this discussion in the future as well. It's fun to have everyone here. But anyway, we can bring this up. This can be brought up again next month or this next meeting or next month. You know, we um, sure welcome that debate and it's very real, it's something we need to all sit down professionally and, and figure it out. Good comments made. And yeah, absolutely, we can bring it from the table. We can create our own resolution um, and do what we like the next meeting. Any other comments? I, just, I think, Dave, you had a good point in that, you know, I, I, I would be in favor of supporting a, a resolution that is more generalized and not geared towards a specific group. And, um, you know, I was actually in the YPG meeting where uh, they supported something similar, and I did uh, express my support at that time. Um, and I thought it was fair of YPG to ask us to support an economic development issue. But as I've uh, lived with this a little longer, um, especially in the last, over the weekend, um, I feel like it is sensible for us to take a, a, a deeper look at this before we consider approval. I, I, I do want to add too that uh, I know Todd Woods and uh, other county commissioners here, and I, I appreciate the work that they've put in on this issue. I know it's not easy, and um, it, it's a democratic process, and we are all responsible to be involved with that. So I'm glad everyone on both sides is here tonight uh, having a voice in that. Go ahead. Um, I would say the same thing, so kudos. It's not easy, as I found out here in my short tenure, to be on the other side of the table. It's easier to be in that seat uh, than to make those decisions, so kudos to them. Uh, but you mentioned a couple industries that we look at here in Yankton. So while I agree, um, 
if you're looking at uh, what the city commission is responsible for, we look at basically being in charge of the infrastructure inside the city limits. But if you look at our four largest industries in the community, you look at healthcare, you look at tourism, you look at agriculture and manufacturing, it is important uh, for the city to support not only those industries, but other industries where we have a chance of growth. So um, if this does get tabled, I would encourage the city commission then to find a viable um, support structure that we can show that we do support um, our agricultural community. I would just like to say again, um, I think it's inappropriate for a city governmental agency to take a position either way um, on an active county governmental deliberation. Um, that said, if we were going to develop some sort of uh, language and resolution in support of ag in the county, absolutely, that's something that we should consider. And um, why APG has supported this, and they, sh they should take a position. They are Yankton area progressive growth. They are growth in the Yankton area, not just in the city limits, okay? But I think it's, as a city governmental entity, I don't think that's our role. We support YAPG. And chiropractors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, roll call, please. Again, you're voting on the motion to table. Uh, no. My bomb. No. Minor. Yes. Moser. No. Sarva. Yes. Gross? No. Johnson? No. Mayor Hoffman? Yes. What have we got, Ellen? 5-3. Motion. So it's, it's not tabled. All right. It's open for more discussion. Okay, uh, what motions. would you, the motion failed, so it's open for another option, or you don't have to do a thing? I make a motion that we support resolution 1747. I'll second it just so you get debate. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the same area? Yeah, I'll have discussion. I, um, uh, I would rather uh, work on another resolution myself than the one presently before us that I think is um, embraces the economic development the, uh, of agriculture, but I think probably would um, be more, um, uh, I think our city, something that would, uh, the citizens of Yankton who we represent would be uh, in support of in a majority. Um, again, I have no difficulty with the supporters for production agriculture I just and much of what I would say I'm guessing they would say um, but I, with one entity I'm just concerned that we lose control of what happens after we support it and that's why I think resolution should be more general and even though we support progressive growth um, you know they again their role I think uh, Amy did say it is to uh, look at economic <laughs> economic development community-wide and so um, um, you know and I don't hear anyone saying don't support progressive growth at this point in time so I, I think it's fine that they do that I just think that we should rewrite this and um, uh, with our own language I agree with the uh, Commissioner Knopf and reiterate what I said earlier uh, and then what Amy had brought up if we're going to support it, it should be a broader um, for uh, agriculture just as a general in our community any anybody else you're not a substitute motion you're actually just debating this yes. I'm just debating I mean I don't know that we need a substitute motion it's something that we just I mean, if it passes, it's done. If it doesn't pass, we can just bring it up at another meeting. You know, work on a resolution, bring it up at another meeting. Any other discussion? 
Roll call, please. My Bob. No. Miner. No. Mosier. Yes. Sarda. No. Gross. Aye. Johnson. No. Mayor Hoffer. Aye. What's the tally, Al? Uh, am I missing somebody? Mr. Knopf, I apologize. No. <laughs> okay, so now we have a 5 3. Three, uh, five being no support. Okay, motion failed. Moving on to item six. Hey, thanks everyone for coming. Come back again next time. Number six under the for memorandum 17 219 for the final acceptance of the fill station project. Move the memorandum for the final acceptance. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Anybody from the public? Roll call, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, go ahead. State your name and. My name is Inez Lapreth. I'm 83 years old. And if there's anything I do know, I know this. The most important thing all of us here possess is our health. And if sir, people, if we don't have our health, we won't have to bother with ag. Hey, thank you I, for we I'm, were talking about final. We're on a different thing, but I know the that. Comment. But I had my hand. That's okay. Can I say a little more, thank you. please? No, thank you, sorry about so. Thank you. Come back next time. Thank really, you. Seriously, we'd like to come back. Sorry about that. Roll call, please. Aye. 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 Johnson. Aye. Mr. Knopf. Aye. I'll call on you this time. Bye, Bob. Aye. Mayor Aye. Motion carried. Ask for motion to adjourn into executive session to discuss contractual matters, litigation, and personnel matters under South Dakota Codified Law 1 25 2. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried.